that I think might be difficult for you. I think students usually have a difficult time with this. But if you have things that, that I'm not covering and you want me to, or if you have questions, just let me know and we'll look at that. But I want to sort of focus on Chapter 9. And then on Friday, we'll open up to Chapter, uh, the rest of Chapter 7 and 8, and then Chapter 9, which will also be on So our Monday's exam is that last part of Chapter 7, just lenses, Chapter 8, and then Chapter 9 as well. OK? Uh, the things I wanted to look at were first just the rest of the concept test questions that we didn't cover in class. I shall probably do those last uh, because the solution to these is online. I have a video solution, but at the end of class, we'll do that. So um, then we'll also look at uh, intensity level, you know, with the decimals, the logarithms, uh, resonances. And what else is it I want to look at? Anything else that stands out to you that you want to think about? That's it. I mean, that's most of what we're doing, except for the, uh, you know, the basic properties of the waves, the velocity, frequency, and wavelength of the waves, and the Doppler effect. We'll treat this like a help session. So if you want to get up and leave, I'm not offended. If you feel like, gosh, I'm really getting this, I know it, or I don't have time, I have something else to do, that's okay. You can get up and leave. I'm not offended. All right, let's look first at resonances. Uh, we have a couple of different things with resonances that we need to understand. First of all, we're doing open-closed tubes. That's a tube that looks like this. And then we're also doing open, open tubes. That's a tube that looks like this. And closed, closed tubes. That's a tube that looks like this. You need to recognize that at the end, anytime I have a closed end, that's a node. So I would have a node right here and an anti-node at the other end. So I'd draw my wave like that. Here, I would have a wave like that. And then here, I would have a wave like that. Now, these waves bounce back and forth, so the other part of the wave, when it bounces back, will look like that. Look like that, and look like that. Now, both of these, the closed, closed, and the open, open, are going to be identical. The way that we'll treat them will be identical. But we need to recognize that this has a quarter wavelength in it. This has a half wavelength in it. And then this has also a half wavelength. It's just sort of flipped around. Okay, so I have a quarter wavelength here, a half wavelength here, and a half wavelength here. Some of the problems ask you to find the frequency. In fact, you'll probably see a problem like that. I'll give you a closed, closed, or open, closed, or open, open to you, and you need to find the frequency. In which case, let's just say, for example, I give you this length. No, oh, I tell you this length is, shoot, I don't know, four meters. Okay, and I ask you to tell me what is the frequency of that wave, of that tone, you know, like the Coke bottle, what is the frequency, the first frequency of that tone? Since I know that the fundamental frequency is a quarter wavelength, then I would say that uh, my one quarter wavelength is equal to the length of the tube, which is four meters. And then I would say, well, lambda then has to be 16 meters. I just solved that for wavelength. And then I would say, well, V is equal to lambda times F. And so F is V over lambda. So that's the basic idea on those, that if I want to know the frequency or the wavelength, I just look at the length of the tube. I ask myself, how many wavelengths are in that tube? For the fundamental frequency for an open closed tube, it's going to be a quarter wavelength. Uh, and then I can derive or I can figure out my frequency in that way. And I gave y'all a an equation to calculate that frequency. They find it. It was uh, well, it was n v over lambda, right? Just double check that out. Yeah. It was. Uh, N V over 4L. The, uh, the, the equation that I gave you for an open closed tube was F equals N V over 4L. That's what we did here. Here this was 4L, right? We found it right here, 4 times the length. 
n in this case is equal to 1 because we're doing the first frequency or the first uh, tone and then V is just the speed of sound and air and I'll provide that to you. All right. Um, you need to also recognize that if I ask you for the second frequency for the open closed tube, the second frequency is not two quarter wavelengths, but in this case, I have three one quarter wavelengths. So for this equation, I have n equal one, three, five, and on and on. Okay? So whenever I cram in an extra quarter wavelength, I don't get an extra quarter wavelength, I get two extra quarter wavelengths. So I get one one quarter wavelength, three one quarter wavelengths, five one quarter wavelengths, seven, nine, odd number of quarter wavelengths. Okay? We do a similar similar thing with these others. Um, I would say that this is L, and I would work through exactly the same way, except I would say, well, a half wavelength is equal to L. Let's say L is 4 meters. Then lambda, then, is 2 times L, or 8 meters. And then you go through the same process of figuring out what are the frequencies. I gave you an equation. It was F equals uh, NV over 2L. And that 2L comes about because of this whole thing that I have a half wavelength. The N is a little bit different here. N is equal to 1, 2, 3, and on and on. Because when I get the next frequency, I can add another full half wavelength. So my next tone, the second fundamental frequency, has two one half wavelengths. The next one has three one half wavelengths. And on and on. Okay? You will see a couple questions regarding this uh, as you need to calculate the frequency, like I did here, either for the open closed tube and the open open or closed closed tube. These are identical, by the way. The way your frequencies are identical is just one is flipped the other way. Okay? I might also just ask you how many, what is this? What fundamental frequency is this? So, for example, let me give you this one. Uh, and I'll just draw some waves. Uh, this should come up all the way. So I'd ask you, how many, what is the frequency here? Well, the way you would count this is you would just count the number of half wavelengths. Which frequency is this? Have any idea? One, two, three, four, five. What do y'all think? Well, look, this is one, right? I have one one half wavelengths. How many half wavelengths do I have here? I have four, right? So this would be the fourth fundamental frequency, or the fourth overtone. Okay? Uh, this one's a little trickier, but it's the same way, right? That I would just count the number of half wavelengths. Let's see if I can do it. It's not really trickier. It's just, you know, let's see. I count the half wavelengths. I see one right there, two right there, uh, three right there, four. So that's also the fourth. Oh, no, uh, three. I'm sorry. One, two, three. No, there are four. Okay? So I have four fundamental frequencies in that. That's the fourth one. But if you see it, you're probably going to see it like this. It's a little easier to, to read. You know, calculate the frequency. You're able to identify which tone that is. Now, could you do that? Any questions about this? No? Now, let's look at decibels and intensity level. If you came in late, by the way, I said we're going to look at several topics. If you feel like you got it, and that's fine. You can get up and go. I'm not offended. Um, let's look at intensity levels. We had a couple different things. We, we uh, defined intensity. That is that I is power over area, and area, remember, is 4 pi r squared. If it's isotropic, that is, the sound is going out in all directions. And then we also have intensity level. Where um, L is equal to 10 times the log of I over I naught. So we had a couple different problems with this, and we'll look at some in the concept test that we did. But 
just be able to, if I give you an intensity, be able to calculate the intensity level or vice versa. If I give you uh, an intensity level, be able to calculate the intensity. The latter of those is usually a little more difficult because you have to deal with the logarithm. So let me just remind you, let's say if, if uh, gosh, I don't know, if L equals 20 decibels, what is I equal to? Okay, so I would say 20 equals 10 log of I over I naught. I would say 20 divided by 10, divide both sides by 10, equals log of I over I naught. And then this would be 10 to the 2, and 10 to the log of I over I naught. So it's going to be 100 equals I over I naught. Okay, so if my decimal level is 20, that means my ratio of I to I naught is equal to 100. And this comes back to if, if say, for example, my decimal level was 10, what would this value be? If this was 10, what would be the ratio of these two intensities? If it's 20, the ratio of these two intensities is 100. If it's 30, the ratio of these two intensities is 1,000, right? If this is 40, 10,000, 50, 100,000. We saw that, that if I change my decimal level, if I increase it by that amount, it multiplies my intensity by uh, 10, 100,000, depending on how much the decimal level changes by. We had a couple questions in the concept test regarding that. Just 10, 20, 30 decibels, how does it change the intensity? Yeah. So does that mean that I will be equal to 100 times the I-O? Is there a value for I-O? Yes. So I is equal to 100 times I naught. Now, if we're just translating intensity into intensity level, I naught is our threshold of hearing. So it's 100 times 10 to the minus 12. That's the threshold for hearing. That's a value that you'll be given on the equation sheet. I have to get your equation sheet up. I'll do it today. I'm sorry for the delay on it, but I'll get it up so that you'll know what all's on there. But um, if you, I'll put it up. If you see something that you think is missing, let me know. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll try to put it on there. Okay. So, but I might also ask you just, you know, what is the ratio? of the intensity with regards to what it was before. So here it was 10 to the minus 12. When I raise it by 20 decibels, it becomes uh, 100 times that. All right? All right, uh, so that's intensity level. What's the third thing I said? Resonances. Let's look at some of those concept tests. We haven't done them all. I'm not going to do them as clickers because, like I said, I was not, I'm, we're done with clickers. But there were a few questions on here I wanted to go over. Uh, if you printed this out, we're not doing this question. I think I told you all that. You should be able to do it, but it's, it's a little more complicated than I wanted to do. Okay, so this has to do with... Uh, superposition of waves. There are several questions here that have to do with superposition of waves. We didn't do this at all in class for chapter 9, but it's exactly like what we were doing for chapter 8. So you'll see superposition of waves both with sound and with light. So here, for example, I have two waves that are traveling towards one another, and I want to know the shape of the string at t equals 6 seconds. Uh, it tells me the speed. So in 6 seconds, if they're traveling at one meter per second, that means that they're going to travel six meters, right? So here I'm at two. That means in six seconds I'll be at eight. So I can redraw this. I'm going to redraw it here. Goes up, and it comes out two like that. And then on the right hand side, similarly, it's going to move uh, six seconds. It'll move six meters. So I'm picking this as my reference point. It will move to this point. And then I want to know how are those two waves here, when they superimpose across one another, what are they going to add up to give? Do you all know offhand? 
Any idea? Or look, I have these two, which are going to add up. Notice they're equal, and they're about this height. That means they're going to come up to this height. And then this will add up with this to come up to here. This will add up with this to come up to here. And so I'm going to get this wave that's superimposed when these two add up. That will look like that. So you can see a question like this. In fact, you might see this question, in fact. So uh, where I have two waves that come together, I might change the speeds or something. Maybe they come together at different places. But a very similar question. Just in general for chapter nine, you don't have any old tests to practice from. You know, the dogs are awesome, and you know, we haven't gotten to chapter nine before this. But uh, it's you're just gonna have I'm gonna pull very closely from the concept test and the homework. So if you can do the concept test and the homework, as well as just sort of the general knowledge and the notes, you know, about parts of the ear, the sort of basic stuff in the notes. Nothing too tricky. I'm just gonna. Pull it, I'm not going to use the exact question, but it'll be very, very similar. So you're going to study by studying the concept test, the ones that I sent out to you. Uh, the homework, you'll certainly see a couple questions from the homework almost verbatim, and then look through the notes. So make sure you know the parts of the ear, parts of the human speech. I think most, many of you can do that, but make sure you know the parts of the ear and how they work and human speech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, here I have two waves. They travel at different speeds. And I just want to know when they come together, how are they going to come together? So the first part is just figuring out where are they going to be at six seconds. At one meter per second, they're going to travel six meters in six seconds. So I think this is a reference point. So this point is going to be six meters over in six seconds. Six meters over is right here. So that's why I redraw it like that. That thing is translated over six meters. And in a similar way, this point will move over six meters in six seconds. So I can translate it like that. Just redraw that shape. And then when I add these two up, there's nothing to superimpose with this part. And then as I start adding these points up, they produce a wave that looks like that. It's similar to what we saw in chapter 7, or chapter 8, rather, and you'll see it with sound as well. Okay, is that, is that cleared up a little bit? All right, so let's say C is the right answer here. Uh, open tube of air supports standing waves, and at no frequencies between these two. So this is an open, open tube, right, like this, where I... Oh, open open tube where I get waves that look like this um, remember our frequency here is n v over 2 l so you should be able to look at this frequency where n is 1 2 3 4 if I have frequencies at 300 and 400 Hertz then that means that uh, 300 Hertz is the third harmonic 400 Hertz is the fourth harmonic Right, because that means V over 2L has to equal 100. And so the second harmonic would be 200, right? Because N is equal to 2 for the second harmonic. So here the answer is, uh, is 200. Okay, this one is very, very similar to chapter 8. So I have two loudspeakers. They have wavelengths of 2 meters. And I want to know, what can you do to get constructive interference? Now, right now, we're not getting constructive interference because uh, I'm just not really, I'm getting some sort of interference, but it's neither complete constructive nor complete destructive interference. So I want to know, how much do I need to move it? Well, let's see. If I move the speaker to the left, move speaker one to the left, a half a meter, I think that's the right answer. Yeah, that is the right answer, actually. If I move this one back a half a meter, then that means this point will move back uh, to right about there. So then, or let's look at it this way. This point will move back a half a meter to there, in which case the peaks and the peaks will line up and the troughs and the troughs will line up. So right now, they're just slightly offset. 
But if I move one of them back just a little bit, then they become uh, in phase so that I can have total constructive interference. If you look at these others, they just don't do that. So if I move speaker one back by a full meter, it moves past that point where they constructively interfere, where they're completely in phase. And that's some way for these others. So I just want to move them so that the peaks and the peaks line up and the troughs and the troughs line up. Again, just like we have in chapter eight, but it still applies with sound. Uh, phase difference for constructive is zero degrees. That's just like chapter eight. So make sure that we're up on that. You should be up on it for chapter eight anyway. Um, remember, out of phase would be 180. 360 would also be in phase. It's the unit circle, right? Zero is the same as 360. This is just like the double slit interference pattern. I have two loudspeakers that are in phase. They emit equal amplitude sound waves with a wavelength of one meter. And then at one point over here, at this point, do I get constructive or destructive interference? Just like with the double slit, I look at my phase, my path length difference. My path length difference here is one meter. If I'm one meter out of phase and my wavelength is one meter, that means I'm one wavelength offset. And so if I look at my waves, one meter offset would mean your second wave would, would start right here so that you're going to get perfect or you'll get constructive interference because they were like this and then they offset by a full wavelength and so now the peaks and the peaks are, are lining up again. It's just like chapter 8 but we're going to see it also with sounds. So you'll see it in the chapter 8 section and in the chapter 9 section. Oh because um, the wavelength of these is one meter and I looked at this 8.5 meters, that's the distance to travel from here to here. And the distance to travel from here to here is 9.5. So one meter here is 9.5 minus 8.5. For these problems and the chapter 8 problems on the double slit, you're always just looking for the path length difference. And you will see from what for chapter 8 too. I just take this extra little bit, which is the extra little bit that it travels, which is one meter. If this was a half a meter, you would get destructive interference. If it was a quarter meter, which is neither a half wavelength nor a whole wavelength, then you would get something in between. That's neither constructive nor destructive, but you know, something in between. Is that clear? Can we do this? Okay. Um, we'll see some beats. We talked about this a little bit. Here, remember the frequency of our beats is the, the difference in the two frequencies that you're combining, the absolute value. So if I have 6, 10 hertz, but I hear 3 beats per second, so 3 is equal to the difference in these two. The difference in 6, 10 and 6, 0, 7 is 3. The difference in 6, 10 and 6, 13 is also 3. So it could be either 2 or 3 it's beating with one of those two frequencies. That's like when we added up the two frequencies in class and we got a wong, wong, wong. Uh, we can either, it's either one of those. You'll probably see a question very similar to that. I'll just ask you, you know, how many beats are these two tones going to produce or something along those lines. Uh, know your nodes and your anti-nodes. Uh, if you have a point that doesn't move, that's These are nodes. These are anti nodes. Uh, what's the name of it? Oh, this is beats again. Just know what they are beats, where you have two nearly equal frequencies, but not equal, but almost equal. Those are called beats. Uh, these are called normal modes. I don't think we even talked about that class. Probably not going to see this on the text, but. And then the frequency of the third harmonic string. Uh, remember, a string is the same as a closed closed pipe. And with a closed closed pipe, 
you have that n value, the frequency is nv over 2l, n here is equal to 1, 2, 3, and on and on. So the frequency of the third harmonic is three times the frequency of the fundamental. The fundamental is when n is equal to 1, it looks like this. The frequency of the third harmonic is when n equals 3, so it's going to be three times that. Uh, so back to this one, actually. I could also ask you about the, say, the frequency of, say, the third harmonic on. No, never mind. I do that. Never mind. Okay. Well, those are sort of, I think, the difficult topics. We also have Doppler shift, which we haven't looked at, um, and the anatomy and physiology section. Just sort of basic stuff on that. Make sure you know the parts of the ear. Make sure you know the uh, the parts that cause speech. If you go onto the screencast section on the online quizzes part, I have a screencast. We sort of did that a little bit quickly last time. I'm sorry for that, but I just I think that was very necessary as well. Have any questions? Yeah. Well, this one was really Okay. Yeah, you'll certainly see that where I ask you about either to just straight up calculate the frequency of a string. So the frequency of a string is 1 over 2L square root of T over mu. And she asked, what is mu? That's our mass density, but it's not a mass density like we've used before. This is the uh, mass density. Uh, length density, so it's our mu is equal to the total mass divided by the total length. So in one of those concept test questions, it actually gave you the, well, it was asking you to calculate the, the mass of the string. Let me find it. Yeah, here, you, this is the one I was thinking of, but here we had to find the mass of the string, uh, or excuse me, the mass density. And here, the mass density, which is going to be the total mass divided by the length, is going to be 10 grams, 10 times 10 to the minus 3, excuse me, yeah, that's right, 10 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms divided by the length, which is 2 meters. And so that's 5 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per meter. And then you would go about and find the frequency of the sound. And then once you know the frequency, um, once you find that frequency, whatever it is, then you say V is equal to lambda times F. We did this one in class. But remember, the lambda here, the wavelength, is twice this. Because if I have a string, I can fit a half wavelength on it. So the wavelength is twice the length of the string. Once you find the wavelength and you know the frequency, then you can find the speed of the wave here. You'll certainly see some questions like that that are similar where you have to take these extra steps. There was another question, not this one because I'm taking that one off, but um, Oh, shoot, I don't see it. Maybe it was in your homework. I think it was in your homework, actually. There's a question. Could you put it up, please? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, tripling the density will result in changing the wave velocity by what amount? Well, we start with this. You're certainly going to see a question like this, y'all. So I have 1 over 2L square root of T over mu. I say certainly. I'm pretty sure you'll see a question like this. We had several on this in the concept test regarding just sort of if you change this, what happens to the frequency, that sort of thing. So here, uh, frequency is 1 over 2L, T over mu. What I'm doing is I'm tripling the density. So I get a, a, a factor of 3 over here. That means I get a factor of 1 over root 3 over here. So my frequency goes down by a factor of root 3. And we want to know how's that going to change the velocity. If I have 1 over root 3 here, I have 1 over root 3 here. And that was the 0.58. Remember in this one, be very careful that 
here I've changed the frequency and I've changed the velocity. That's not usually the case. The only reason that's the case here is because I'm actually changing the medium. And the wavelength on a string is fixed because the wavelength is always twice the length of the string. Uh, but here, because I'm changing the mass density, I've changed the speed of the wave. Which isn't usually the case. We said previously that if I change the frequency, it doesn't change V, it changes the wavelength. So like the mass density should be fixed to the medium? The mass density has to do with the medium. In fact, all of these things over here have to do with the medium. Uh, the tension, the mass density, and the length. And in changing any one of those things will change the frequency. You mean the velocity? Or the velocity, yes. Okay. Okay. Any any other questions? Cal? I have a video of it. Yeah, yeah let me show you. Uh, if you just go to the website and go to the online quizzes site. In fact, all the screencasts, these are for my online class, but this is just all the screencasts. But then here's the solution. Usually I don't make it public, but I've already made it. So it's just me working through all the quick tests that you had in your book, as well as the solutions to all of these. Okay? Yeah, that's why I didn't go over my class, because they're available there as well. Uh, if you go to the website, if you go under online quizzes, is you know all the classes we answer in class, they answer online, uh, and you can find the solution down here. You can find all the solutions. Like here's chapter eight, chapter seven. Those are all available there. They're just screencasts of me working through those problems. Okay. Other questions? Are we making an exercise today? Huh? Are we making an exercise today? Are we doing an exercise today? If y'all have questions about lenses, if y'all want to do lenses, I can. If, if y'all want to go, that's fine. But uh, this is good for your exam, too. Y'all want to look at some lenses though? Okay. If you don't want to, that's fine. Please feel free to go if you want. Uh, let's take a look at someone. Are there any more questions about sound? No? All right. Yeah, we'll take a look at some lenses. So with lenses, um, let's see. We need to remember the lens equation. 1 over F equals 1 over Q plus 1 over P. And then also our magnification is negative Q over P, just like it was for, uh, you know, mirrors is exactly the same. It will help you to remember your ray diagrams or at least what type of lenses form what type of images for convex and concave. Uh, remember with convex I have three different configurations. I can have the image, the object outside, at, or inside the focal point. Uh, if it's outside the focal point, the image this is my image, this is my object, will be right there. This one will form no image. And this one will form an image. This is my object. My image will be right here. This is like a magnifying glass. For a magnifying glass, you have to hold it up close to the lens. Uh, and in this case, I have a virtual bigger upright image. Remember, all virtual images are upright because if Q is negative, M is positive. Uh, the one up top here is a real. All inverted images are real because if Q is positive, M is negative. So a negative magnification means it's inverted. Negative Q means it's virtual. Positive Q means it's real. Just a second, I'll write that down. But let me write this down first. So I have a real inverted image and then positive magnification means upright negative magnification means inverted um, positive Q means real negative Q means virtual all real images are inverted. All virtual images 
are upright. Just knowing those things will help you in some of the problems because just like with the mirrors, you'll have some problems where there won't be things stated. Like I won't tell you what kind of lens it is. You'll have to figure out, okay, what, what type of image is this thing forming? So for example, if it forms a real image, you know it has to be a convex lens. Because as it turns out, concave lenses do not form uh, real images. No matter where you put the object, the image is always upright, virtual, and real. I mean, upright and virtual. So as you work through problems, and we'll work through some on Friday as well, but as you work through problems regarding these, just remember these things that will really help you to uh, remember what type of mirrors form, what, what type of lenses form, what type of images. You probably will have a ray tracing diagram, but you know what, it's going to be an easy one. I think this is the easiest of them. There are no funky virtual rays. You just need to know how to draw those three rays. Let me show you right quick. So I have a, a convex lens. I have my two focal points. I have an object outside the focal point. My first ray goes parallel to the axis through the focal point. My second ray goes through the focal point parallel to the axis. Uh, and then I can draw another ray that goes straight through the center of the lens. I think those are the only rays we drew, right? Yeah, so anything that's not one of these is not correct. So be careful, I can draw it through the center of curvature too, and that would not be correct. Like I could draw it through the center of curvature and then parallel to the axis, or through the focal point and then through the center of the lens, whatever. But just note this ray diagram. I'm not too terribly concerned for you to know how to draw the rays, but it will help you to know what type of images are formed by what type of lenses. Uh, also in that chapter, Remember that convex lenses have a positive focal point. Concave lenses have a negative focal point. I'll never actually tell you the sign of the focal length, but you always need to figure out, is this a convex or is it a concave lens? And then go from there. Also, don't forget the focal length is half the center of curvature. Often, I'll just give you the center of curvature. That's not uncommon when you talk about lenses to just give the center of curvature because that's more the the physical meaning of what that is, is the actual curvature of the shape. Um, and then also you're going to have combination of lenses. Combination of lenses. We can look at some problems. Well, let's say that I have two lenses. If I have an object here, I find where the first image is, an image here, and then this distance becomes my object distance, and then I form my last image over here. This is my final image. We work through some like that in class. And if you look back at the old test, you'll see an example on practically every old test. I'm not going to have it so that you have a virtual object. You follow what I'm saying? You remember what I'm talking about? I think y'all did that in lab where if you move the lenses really close together, you form a virtual object. So if this lens is on this side of the first image, you make this object distance negative, but you're not going to see that on the exam. And then I think the last of aberrations, uh, and that was the last of chapter 7, you had a spherical and chromatic aberrations. Uh, you need to know what causes those, what they're prevalent in, and how to fix them. Spherical, the rays don't all focus at the same point. So if I have rays in the outside and the inside, they will focus at slightly different points. So spherical aberrations are just due to the spherical shape of the lens. This also occurs in mirrors. Chromatic aberrations, on the other hand, has to do with the index of refraction of light. So blue light. Let's probably get this fixed up. I think there. Oh, shoot. You can see a problem like this. If I give you a plot of N versus lambda, it looks like this. Uh, blue light has a 
shorter wavelengths. So this is blue and this is red. So the red is not going to bend as much. So blue will look like this. Red will look like this. You know, follow what I did there? I looked at this graph. This, this to be a good test question, actually. The red is longer wavelength. So yes, OK, a longer wavelength, n is less. That means the light will bend less from its original path. So the red light here, the red light that comes in, will bend less than the blue light because the index of refraction is less. And so you'd get the blue light here and the red light here. OK? Uh, that's chromatic aberration is due to the, the wavelength dependence on the index of refraction. Um, for spherical, to fix it, you put a diverging lens here. Oh, wait, no, 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 sorry. Uh, the primary way to fix spherical, you can put a diverging lens, but the primary way is to put an aperture. It's to just block the light from the outer parts of the lens. And then for chromatic, you can put a system of lenses in, or in front of this to affect the light differently. It's just more complicated than just a single lens. That's it for chapter 7. Um, chapter 8, no single slit, no double slit, no interference, and no the diffraction gradient. Chapter 8 isn't really terribly difficult because all those are, are pretty similar, which kind of makes it a little more difficult. The double slit and the diffraction gradient are identical. So when you look at those, think about them the same way. The single slit is a little bit different. So make sure that you're aware of how it's different. If, you're, if you look at the equation sheet, it talks about dark versus bright fringes, and that should help you. Interference is similar, too. All right. Any particular questions about this? We're going to come back to it on Friday. We'll spend some more time on it on Friday. You want to look at some old tests and just sort of scroll through them? Y'all holler out if you see me. Yeah, let's just look at some old tests. We've probably worked through a lot of them, but or not a lot of them, but some of them. Most of your exams are going to be exam four, the final exam. Uh, disregard anything that has to do with mirrors. Like here's some good lens problems, calculating various things from the lens problems. This is spring 15. Uh, did we do farsightedness? We did not do that, did we? Any kind of problems of the eye? Uh, make sure you know about the camera versus the eye. Are you all familiar with that? We did a couple questions. Let's address that. You might see that on Monday. You know, the camera and the eye are very similar. The only difference is for the eye, the image distance is fixed. For the camera, the focal length is fixed. So if I look at the eye, I have a convex lens and the retina. This distance which is Q, is always fixed. It's always the same. So my eye is Q. If I'm looking at something that's far away, the light rays coming into the eye are parallel. They're going to focus at the retina. But if I look at something that's closer, that's up close, these light rays are going to travel like this and then focus on the retina like that, such that the focal point is here and the focal point is here. Oh, that's not right. Focal point would be like right here. All right, so if I'm looking at something far away, my focal point is big. If I'm looking at something close, my focal point gets smaller in the eye. I'm looking at something distant, the focal point is at the retina. The focal point is never going to move behind the retina. It will always be between the lens and the retina. Far away it's here. Then as you look at things closer, this squeezes down the ciliary muscle in your eye, squeeze the lens, and make it fatter in the middle so that the focal point changes to get shorter. Now for the camera, 
We have some concept test questions about these. Uh, for the camera, if I'm looking at something far away, I have parallel light rays. They will focus here. For the camera, I have a fixed focal point. So if I want to look at something close, my focal point remains the same. I can draw my rays parallel to the axis through the focal point through the focal point parallel to the axis. So if I want to look at something close, I have to move my film back there. I have to separate. Okay? Make sure you understand. I could ask you, what if you look at something closer or farther away, what do you have to do to the film or what do you have to do to the lens of your eye in order to do that? Those are similar. They're just a little bit different in what changes. In your eye, your image distance is fixed. In a camera, the focal length is fixed. If you want to look, if you want to take a picture of something nearby, you have to increase the distance between the lens and the film. Okay. What do you mean by a fixed focal point? Uh, on the camera, you can't change out your lens. I mean, on some cameras you can change out your lens, but most cameras you can't change the lens. And so the focal point of that lens remains the same. But in your eye, your eye has little muscles that change the shape of the lens, mm -hmm. and that's how we focus on things at different distances. Oh, okay. All right. All right, folks. I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to have more questions, but I'll certainly stay as much as Any more questions? No. Okay, well remember, I'm around on Wednesday, but I'm not going to come to this room.